from each panelist, would you please share your scholarly activities related to discussing diversity of the human experience through children's literature? Do we have a panelist who'd like to kick us off? I'll start. Hi, my name is um, Angela Wiseman, and um, I'll just start with a brief answer to this. I use children's literature to explore critical social issues. And there's two ways that I do this. First, I use content analysis to analyze children's literature uh, related to important topics. Some of the um, topics I've addressed include like how death is represented in children's literature. And you know, this it's an important topic because it affects everybody. And we need to look at how um, how it's described, how it's written about, and um, and how that is in alignment with what it, we know is psychologically best practices. Um, also looking at like how bullying is represented. And in the same way, when we're thinking about using children's books, we also want to make sure that they're accurate, that they're representing what they're, rep you know, what they're saying they're representing and that they're um, describing important topics in ways that are good for children. Um, then I also really think about how to use these books with children and families in ways that reflects the diversity of human experience. Um, so I think that one of the best ways to have conversations about important topics is to bring in children's literature, but also to show the diversity of different kinds of um, experiences is to use that as a discussion point. And I'll, I'll just stop there. I may wanna jump in later, but I thought I'd let um, some of the other panelists talk. Okay, I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, I do research related to representation, equity, and access. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done lately uh, leans more toward access. Uh, I've done work on eliminating book deserts uh, in, within schools, uh, particularly in urban communities of color. Uh, I think I started out, I would say, when I was a classroom teacher. I actually taught in Florida, and a lot of people don't know that I taught in Gainesville, Florida. And one of the things that I did when I was there was I worked with um, teaching tolerance. They actually gave me a classroom grant to start working with uh, my students on diversifying the curriculum within our classroom. Uh, we were having a lot of issues. I was very similar to a lot of the teachers who uh, are here today where we were having issues with students not getting along uh, related to racial issues, related to uh, you know, different uh, SES. And so uh, the grant allowed me to purchase books. We would discuss books together as a class and the students were um, able to develop beautiful stories. I wish I, I wish I had saved some of those stories to share today, but um, it's interesting because even 20 years later, my students are now adults. I see them on Facebook and they're, they're just amazing. They have friends of different races and they're going to uh, into spaces that they never thought they would be able to. And I think that I would like to think that uh, that came from that start in, in those early kindergarten and first grade classrooms where I was teaching, where, you know, I was giving them exposure to different experiences, different windows, as Rudine Sims Bishop would say. Uh, I also worked um, at Clemson University. I coordinated the first um, African-American read-in that was statewide. And that was interesting because uh, I can tell you <laughs> that, uh, you know, it's about as welcome as everybody feels right now. Um, you know, there were a lot of people even back then who were keeping children from books. You know, this is not, I don't think that this is a new topic at all. Uh, I remember calling and principals saying, I don't want that program at the school. Um, I would call other schools and they would say, well, you can read the books, but I need to read every single book, every single page to make sure you're not introducing any kind of controversy. Uh, and we were literally uh, reading books like uh, Natasha Anastasia Tarpley's I Love My Hair, you know, but those books were being scrutinized heavily. Uh, I worked or I did research in a youth development camp. I don't know if you all have ever been to one in South Carolina. The youth development camp is actually for children who commit pretty heinous crimes, but instead of going to the prison system or the juvenile system, they send them to a youth development camp. 
And in that capacity, I found that the students had zero access to education. So I implemented literature circle book clubs by training the school counselors and uh, the children were able to get access to books that they had never heard of, topics that they'd never heard of. And I think it was that work that was critical for me because it really changed the way I do research on diversity uh, after doing that project. Because I realized the lack of depth that students get uh, or you know, the lack of exposure they get to topics. Uh, to give you an example, they were reading the Diary of Anne Frank because we elected to do banned books because they said they liked books, renegade books, that was what they called them. <laughs> so we uh, read the Diary of Anne Frank. And during the time that they read the Diary of Anne Frank, they kept saying, what is this war that's going on? They had no idea they had never even heard of the Holocaust. And these were children who were in grades uh, six through grade 12, never heard of it. Um, and the funny story is they ended up learning about the uh, sound of music. They had never heard, they were like, what's the sound of music? So the counselors, they were so funny. They actually played it and the kids were running around the camp singing the songs <laughs> from the Von Trapp family. Um, but I, I love that they were able to have that experience because I think you know, having access to books really helped them escape those circumstances. Uh, I also worked with the South Carolina Book Award Committee at the time. And the South Carolina Book Award Committee, I don't know if you all know this, but they've been in the news lately where the uh, South Carolina board has cut ties with them. And just know that this is, again, it's not something that's new. When I was on that committee, uh, we had some of the same conversations regarding books. Um, there were groups that were writing us letters saying, you know, um, if you all select books about children who ride motorcycles, we'll boycott the book award list. <laughs> you know, it was some, something as simple as that. And so um, for me, when I hear so much about these different challenges and things like that, I think as somebody who's worked with all these challenges for so long and push to get diverse books in schools. I don't, I don't think I get as upset about it. Um, I do know that I, I've had colleagues that I know who've gotten terminated over uh, using books, but um, it is a little bit different for me because it's not something that's new. I think that book banning has gone mainstream now. And I think uh, the people who've worked on these uh, issues for 20 plus years, like I have, we understand that we understand where this is going. Uh, there will be at some point a reckoning. You cannot have this level of pushback against student learning because at the end of the day, uh, we all know that children have to take standardized tests. And I believe that the parents who are, you know, just kind of standing by watching how things are unfolding, I don't see them sitting down and allowing this to continue much longer. Um, Again, I've seen book banning before. I worked in Florida. We had the same issue when they banned the Harry Potter series. So, <laughs> and now they're reading Harry Potter all over Florida. So there will be a time where this does come to an end. We're just at the height of it now. And um, I really, if I had to deliver a message to every teacher in the audience today, I would say, please do not give up hope. Please keep pushing because we will get through this. So I apologize if I took too long, I'll go ahead and leave the floor open for the next panelist. Yeah, thank you so much. I think this is a perfect segue into what I was going to share about my research and thinking about it's interesting that we're at this this climax of you as you said about book challenges, yet also increasing demands and pressures on standardized test testing. And particularly what I've noticed both in my former classroom teaching experience and working with pre-service teachers and practicing teachers is a big pressure on teaching specific standards, feeling constrained by the standards and feeling constrained by a scripted ELA curricula that they have to use. And what I'm really interested in with my research related to children's literature is the pedagogical opportunities of how we can teach, um, particularly my focus is in the primary grades, how we can teach those unconstrained language skills across discourse, comprehension, and writing through children's literature and through purposeful dialogue. And 
within those language spaces and those those academic skills that we're building in the early grades, I think we as a field have to encourage um, our school boards and our districts to allow teachers to really build on the diverse funds of knowledge of, our, of their students in their classrooms. And that there's not just one way to comprehend a text, not just one way to talk about a text. And there's multiple multiple funds of knowledge that each child has that they can draw upon to build a deeper understanding of the text and a deeper collective experience of the messages that you can really create and the new understandings you can develop in a read aloud with children's literature. And some of my recent research has really looked at uncovering and sustaining diverse cultural and local funds of knowledge with rural primary teachers, and particularly in North Carolina. And this was important to me as a Asian American and former teacher from North Carolina and from a rural community. And that particularly in, in mainstream media, we tend to homogenize rurality as predominantly or entirely white. And in rural North Carolina, we actually have schools that serve large populations of students of color and many schools that are majority black or african-american and as well as large hispanic populations and so i really uh in this research that i did with rural primary teachers i wanted to look at the ways that they used dialogic teaching as both a teaching approach that follows purposeful and cumulative and substantive dialogue to enhance deeper learning, but also a dialogic philosophy in that we can use a discourse of multiple types of cultural and local funds of knowledge to develop deeper understandings. And so in that, I looked at the ways that they supported students with their read alouds with children's literature to develop diverse kinds of texts to self connections and connections that drew upon their cultural identities, ways that they could connect to the ways that they relate to themes in the story, like Abuela, they could connect to their memories with their grandmothers from Guatemala or the experiences that they have at home. And then as well as connecting to their intersections of their local funds of knowledge of their rural communities and how they can think of, compare to texts like Last Stop on Rocky Street, where it's a very learning about an urban area and how that's different, and but what ways are similar to the ways that they engage with families in their rural communities. And I think in addition to kind of supporting those funds of knowledge, both cultural and local, and thinking about how our diverse human experiences have multiple intersections of different, you know, races and cultures and gender identities and places, also, it was a really nice experience to look at the way the primary teachers engaged in learning about the funds of knowledge alongside their students in a really dialogic approach. And they would bring in community members from the community, particularly one teacher that I worked with. She was actually a international visiting teacher originally from Jamaica, and she brought in uh, local his historians from their community to teach about ways this, that about the history of their rural area where they would you know, have a map and pictures like here we used to have a movie theater like here this is where the drugstore was and then they when you know, they have critical changes about ways that their community has changed and different things that have moved over time and it was really fascinating because she talked about how much she was learning about her new home and in allowing her young children to learn about the history of their communities that their families have been in for such a long time and i think that that is the power of using children's literature to support and sustain the diverse funds of knowledge that students already have, but also learn deeper about the communities that we live in and the different, the diverse types of identities that are involved in those communities. And I think we, we have to continue to be creative in using children's literature and, and using appropriate uh, purposeful dialogue and not being, you know, not being so intimidated by the challenges or the difficulties with curricula that we still don't create those spaces for those learning opportunities. So, glad to share. Great, thank you all. Um, so our second question here, for each panelist, would you please share your scholarly activities related to supporting children's reading responses to children's literature that highlights the diversity of the human experience? I don't mind. Oh, you go ahead, go ahead. Dr. Flowers. <laughs> well, thank you so much. 
Um, so I just wanted to say I recently um, I stopped reviewing, but I was a reviewer for ALA Book Lives uh, between 2018 to 2023. And so I spent a lot of time actually evaluating uh, books and my position, uh, you know, was part time, but my position or freelance, but my position actually um, focused more on looking directly at diverse books, specifically African-American books or books that uh, ALA would get these really interesting books and they weren't really sure who should review them. So I would end up with those books. <laughs> and so my position allowed me to really not just write a general review for the books. I had to think about how children would interact with those books in the classroom, in libraries, uh, whether, you know, librarians should add them to their collections. Uh, and so in that capacity, I think it gave me kind of a unique perspective. So from there, I segue to uh, ILA. They actually asked me, which is the International Literacy Association for some people in the audience that may or may not know. Uh, they asked me to work on the culturally relevant text collection. And this was actually at the height of the controversy that uh, when, when book banning started during the pandemic. And so I put together a team of scholars and we evaluated hundreds of books and we developed sample book lists and we developed a training for teachers to really help them understand how children interact with diverse books uh, and how to respond to diverse books so that it would give them an inkling of what to do. This was right after I finished my training in Georgia uh, where I was going across the state training teachers in the African-American reading. Uh, even though the African-American reading has been around for a couple of decades, uh, most the majority of the teachers in Georgia just received training in 2020. So a lot of these challenges, I'll say again, it's really not surprising because for the first time in two decades, many of these teachers are just getting training on these topics. Uh, additionally, children are just getting access to books that children across the country have had for more than three decades uh, in terms of looking at diverse experiences of characters within text. So I'll stop there and let another panelist pick up. I'll jump in. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of building on both what um, Dr. Flowers and Dr. Outlaw were talking about uh, is ways of thinking of the importance of diverse books. And I like the way Dr. Outlaw was talking about funds of knowledge. Um, I lean on, <clears throat> excuse me, I lean on Rudine Sims Bishop's framework of windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. Window is, um, sorry, I'd like to start with the mirror. The mirror is that you want to see yourself in literature. We want kids to see themselves. And that would be like mirroring their experiences. Um, a window is where you look out and see somebody else's experience and, and that, you know, and we want people to do that and, and understand that there's different perspectives. Then a sliding glass door is actually really engaging and having a full experience. It's that feeling where you just have such empathy for the characters and you're really um, understanding more and really engaging highly. And, and these are all really important aspects of thinking about diverse books. Um, as our classrooms are getting more diverse, we're having this increase of book banning. And along with um, the increase of book banning is a concept called preemptive censorship. And that is that when people hear about all these, and you know, teachers are hearing about this, and we, we just heard a list of very brave teachers and librarians that had gotten fired, and so what happens with preemptive censorship is you censor before anybody does anything because you feel that fear and that pressure, which is when you hear all of those stories, that's understandable. But we also wanna think about the representation and the, the populations in our classroom and how important it is for them to see themselves and experience others. Um, I started working just a couple of weeks ago with some colleagues um, reading, <laughs> picture books with a kindergarten classroom about diverse families. And we were thinking about that framework of windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And just recently, Stephanie Tolliver added the 
the notion of telescopes, which is seeing into the future. She says, humans need these devices because our eyes cannot collect the amount of light needed to see things that are extremely distant. So a telescope helps to amplify the unseen by magnifying things that are too far away for us to see our, on our own. And we were thinking for kindergartners, we want them to know that what who they grow up to be is is good. You know, the that that if they are different races, if they have different sexual or gender identities, that they are good, that we accept them. And so books can be a way for, for, for supporting that because you can see and discuss and see that this is good. So as these books are being banned and as, as there's the fear that causes the preemptive citizenship, I just wanna say I'm very concerned and I'm very thankful for this panel to further this discussion because it's really important. It's really important for kids to see themselves and to know even telescopically that um, that there's acceptance for them and that they can be who they are. Yeah, thank you so much um, for sharing. I wanted to build on, I like that Dr. Wiseman shared about the telescopic kind of lens and that, and it, it makes me think of a present and future. And so one of my recent uh, research, I did a um, participatory teacher ac action research in a classroom with elementary students who had been identified with um, exceptionalities for social emotional skills. And I, in that action research study, I looked at how read alouds with children's literature could provide opportunities for students to not only respond uh, with you know their identities as their current social selves, but also how they would might like to envision their future social self, and then later opportunities for them to think about opportunities where they could transform their social worlds at school and rethink their future identities. And I think that that that's the really the power of children's literature because you can have those interactive read alouds and those those critical discussions, and it's. And it's not, you know, we don't even, sometimes we don't, we uh, overlook how critical young students can engage in reflection with text. And I mean, I had students where students that are typically labeled from a deficit perspective, where they have a label of being you know, um, emotionally disturbed or developmentally, de developmentally delayed, um, but when we're when we're doing our read alouds, they were not positioned from places of deficit, but places where they had opportunities to critically self-reflect on their own social actions and how they wanted to view themselves socially with their classmates, with their friends, and with their families. And I think that those are the kinds of reading response opportunities we can have that reflect diversity of the human experience. Great, thank you all. And um, I'm I'm going to tie into this one also with a, a little bit of um, shameless promotion. I also host a podcast known as Classroom Caffeine, and Stephanie Tolliver is um, a past guest. So I will make sure that that um, a link to that episode makes it onto our resources page as well. Um, it was before her her telescope metaphor, but she's got some wonderful information about um, speculative fiction and particularly. Um, some black girl magic in there. So uh, if you are interested in her work, I would highly recommend checking out that conversation with Stephanie Tolliver. So thank you all again for your responses to those um, to those three questions. And I think at this point, I turn it over to Janet, Dr. Outlaw. We can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me. Now, okay. I've, now I've gone, hold on. Now I've gone wild with the presentation. Here we go. <laughs> it sounds like it wouldn't let me unmute. Oh no. Okay. Um, so thinking about, we thought about some of the ways uh, that we think about discussing diversity of the human experience, supporting children's reading responses to diversity in children's literature. For each panelist, could you please offer tangible ways for educators to provide opportunities for children to share 
or write their own diverse stories and in ways that can counter systemic erasure in the context of challenge books. So I'll jump in again. Um, one thing I, I really work a lot with trauma informed approaches and um, have done a lot of out of school kinds of community based um, programs where we bring in art or we use children's literature as a foundation for discussing and kind of uh, working through our, our thoughts and feelings about different aspects. And really the, the biggest thing, the most important thing for me is to think about building a supportive community and classroom teachers play an important role in providing that kind of climate and developing that climate. And I know it's really hard right now, again, thinking about the fear of this, you know, um, the censorship, the preemptive censorship, also the stress around um, standardized testing, but ultimately um, the way that a teacher approaches and create kind of creates a uh, culture of caring in the classroom is key. And, and really thinking about how um, different experiences are ex accepted and supported. Um, and so things like creating classroom norms that where we listen to each other, we respect each other, making um, diverse literature, an essential part of the classroom where we talk about things like even just explaining books or windows and mirrors. And, you know, there's there's many different perspectives for us to understand. Um, and also providing some tools for engaging with just with topics that are that could be tricky. Um, and one of my favorites, um, I'm going to call out another scholar that I absolutely love, um, Roberta Price Gardner's work. She uses visual methods to discuss racial injustice in picture books with, um, with young children. And she takes visual thinking strategies, which are just, it's, it's three very simple questions. She's modified it a little bit. So she'll read books um, about racial injustice. And she asks these five questions. What is happening in this picture? What do you see that makes you feel that? How does what you see make you, you feel? And this is a true, those three questions are fairly traditional VTS visual thinking strategies. But she adds, what does seeing this image make you wonder? And what questions do you have about what's happening and what would you change in this picture? And I think opening up what would you change invites readers, even the youngest readers, to start critically engaging with images and think about action and change, kind of thinking of a critical literacy framework. And so I just think activities like that, where you can engage together in conversations and have the opportunity to consider how images um, maybe need to be changed or evo evoke certain feelings, but in a very caring, supportive community. Okay, so I'll jump in and talk about some of the ideas that I had. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of schools uh, online have been supporting uh, little free libraries. And so what the schools have had to do or what the principals of the schools have had to do is actually put a disclaimer on the little free library saying, you know, this is not affiliated with the school but the teachers are literally filling the little free libraries with banned books uh, and books that have been challenged. And the children, are the children and parents are circulating the books around the community, <laughs> you know, because I think that their thinking surrounding that issue is they just wanna get books in the hands of children, the books that they really wanna read. The other thing is uh, I visited a school in Iowa probably about five years ago. And the librarian actually had the children write their own stories down. And the children were able to go through the writing process. I think they were using the writing workshop framework uh, out of New York. 
the children ended up publishing their stories in the library. And so they were able to go back and check out books that they had written from kindergarten all the way through fifth grade. And their peers were able to check them out as well. They even had a little barcode on the back. So it was actually like a real library book, which I thought was adorable. There's also uh, partnering with nonprofits that are doing uh, book giveaways because typically when, unless there is a law stating that someone cannot bring books into a school and pass them out, uh, typically this is a good way to help increase children's library collections. Um, and also I just finished working with, um, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the early NCTE Early Career Educator of Color program. And we just had a scholar who was faced with issues related to book banning in her district about two years ago. And since that time, she actually was able to negotiate. It was a very conservative district. She was able to negotiate with the parents to uh, have the kids discuss the books that they were concerned about. So they actually started their own podcast within her classroom. And they podcasted books uh, that the parents uh, were getting ready to challenge, but they hadn't even read the books. And so the children went and read the books, they did the podcast, they even had town hall meetings as a classroom. And so it was a good way for children to understand the political process, as well as discussing books that they wouldn't have access to during these tumultuous times and getting the chance to really read and comprehend those texts. So that's all I have for now. So I'll, I'll share a few things that, that sort of tie into what um, both, both Dr. Wise and Dr. Flowers said. Um, so I noticed too, that when there was such a sharp uptick of challenged books, that little free libraries in my area suddenly became stocked with those very same books. Um, and, and particularly knowing the people in my, in my community who, uh, who had these little free libraries, it was very intentional. In fact, there's one, one man a few streets over um, he, he had multiple copies of, of the books that were challenged in our community um, in his little free library. And, and just uh, for anyone who's, who's on the, the call this evening who may not be a, very aware of little free libraries, if you go, if you Google them, go to their website, there is actually a map where you can search by, uh, by zip code for little free libraries in your area. So there's a, a, little, a little tip. Um, along those same lines, I think that one thing, um, that makes me smile about all these book challenges is that it actually does increase the sales of these books. Um, I can tell you that for uh, book challenge um, committees that I have sat on, uh, extra books, copies of those books had to be purchased for every member of the committee. So it is um, it has increased our our uh, access to these books. So uh, kind of a maybe a wild backfiring for for the um, for the folks who are trying to uh, to ban the books in the first place. Um, and then can you all still hear me? Okay, clearly I've been on my AirPods for too long today. Um, they've given up. Uh, so so in really in direct response to this question here uh, about tangible ways that educators can provide opportunities. I love the idea of kids writing their own stories and certainly in your own school, talk to the person who who staffs your media center to ask if if they would be willing to open up a um, a school authored, uh, collection of books, because I've seen this done very successfully in, in multiple school libraries. It's a great way for kids to see their writing in print. It's a great way to share diverse stories. Um, and, and I will also say that in, in the context of the children's literature course that I teach now, um, one way that we work within these kind of sticky parameters of what can and can't be read is that we always start with the individual children. Um, and in fact, in our lesson planning for read alouds, uh, one of the prompts is to describe your audience. And um, the students who've worked with me for a long time now know that they don't start that with their lexile range and their guided reading levels. No, no, no. We start with what do they like? What do they do? Who do they th think they are? Now, of course, if you know if they want to to, to talk about a range of reading abilities, that is a okay. But um, I always push back whenever children are reduced to numbers and to standardized ways of understanding or, or us thinking that we understand who they are. Um, and, and that's really what I think. I know I read a lot of doom and gloom as we got, got kicked off, um, kicked off the, the webinar this evening. 
But I think there's also a lot of hope here as well. There's hope in this idea of community, like Dr. Wiseman was talking about, connecting with other folks who are like-minded, who want to ensure that kids have access to books. Um, and again, like Dr. Flowers was saying, bring it back to kids. Who are they? What do they want to read about? It's much harder, I think, to argue with a book selection when it's driven by our students' ideas than whenever it is brought in from a teacher's perspective. So I think that anytime we can involve children in the decision making, um, get them asking those critical questions, identify what it is that they want to read about, um, there, there's a, a lot of ways to push back um, if, if you're ever questioned for those decisions. Uh, because I do think it becomes much more difficult to to say you're not reading the right things when you say, well, this is what the kids wanted to read. Thank you so much for talking about the ways that we can encourage student writing as thinking about their interests, their identities as readers and humans and connecting with the communities they live in. So thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. Hey, it's the moment that we have been um, waiting for in terms of larger uh, conversation and dialogue with everybody in the room. Um, so this is, we have about 30 minutes remaining um, in the webinar. And so this is an opportunity for the participants in the space to um, pose a question to our panelists and also just open up um, the space for, for dialogue. Also, if other folks want to join in and um, share thoughts in response to a question that's posed to the group, like this is the time for that. Um, we did in the registration form have an opportunity for people to pose a question. And so we have some ready to go um, in the event that uh, folks are still sort of forming their thoughts or thinking about a question. But um, you can feel free to pose a question in the chat. I'll keep an eye there. Um, it's also uh, encouraged, welcomed, uh, if you want to come off mute and then pose a question um, to the panel uh, that way also. Um, but we have a good amount of time here where we can open up for conversation. So while we're um, giving folks a minute to to sort of gather their thoughts and form a question. Why don't we um, start with just the first question here for the panel and then following that, we'll see if there's um, folks that wanna come off mute or if any questions we put in the chat. But um, to panelists or to other folks, what ways have you seen teachers and librarians continue to explore diversity in literature amid censorship that targets historically marginalized communities? So how are you seeing teachers and librarians kind of continuing to advance um, efforts to highlight and elevate and celebrate diversity sort of no matter what uh, is, is going on in the, the sociopolitical context that we live in? Or I can start us off um, with uh, an example I have with the with the study I did with rural primary teachers, and this this study also took place um, during the pandemic, and there was heightened social tensions. And it was a very difficult, traumatic time, and and she had a very scripted ELA curricula that she had to work with as well. But she shared with me her reflections on that it was a personal mission for her to still deliberately and carefully and thoughtfully bring in discussions about race and culture in her second grade classroom. And she was and she was very honest and transparent that from how she had grown up as, as a white female, she was raised not to talk about race, not to talk about color and to ignore it or silence it. And so she was really made a conscious effort to herself and recognizing that she was teaching a classroom of majority African-American students, that it's not something that we can just ignore and like it's not there. But and when we're reading texts, when we're having discussions and when we're talking about English language arts, we're connecting to social studies and any content we're learning, we can still explore our identities, explore our cultures, explore the ways that we engage with literacy and knowledge in our families and connect that back to school. And so I think that even with political challenges and book challenges, I think there are still really passionate teachers that are continuing, it's their mission to continue to make inclusive classroom environments where all their students feel included and you know feel loved. 
So I just wanted to say, I'm actually working with two scholars now who are in the uh, Early Career Educator of Color program for NCTE. And one of the scholars is a professor uh, and he's actually uh, spending, spending time doing his project, working with librarians and teachers that wanna diversify their bookshelves. And these are teachers who've never uh, you know, engaged with diverse books before. And so even though all of these things are going on within, you know, the state where he is, he's still going, he still went ahead and did the research project, worked with the teachers and librarians for two years. So, you know, I say that to say that people are moving on. I mean, I know that all of this stuff is going on, but the people who do this work, we're going to continue to do the work. The classroom teacher that I'm working with is a fifth grade classroom teacher uh, in the Midwest. She is required to use a scripted curricula. She actually went to her principal, and I don't want to give too much of her presentation away because she's presenting at NCTE this year. But she actually uh, went to her principal and she got special permission for nine weeks to work on uh, literature circles with her fifth graders. And what she did, she was very crafty because what she did is she looked at the reading scores and the comprehension prior to. So she documented everything that she did with the scripted curricula. And then she showed where she made um, a conscious choice to kind of change the books that she was using for the curriculum and still teach the same concepts. And the students uh, scored higher than everybody in the district. So now the district is asking, you know, are, are these books really making a difference? Because we're looking at the scores, you know, what are we doing here using these scripted curricula and trying to avoid all this controversy? If student learning is getting better by using these books that people are telling us not to use. And so, you know, those kind of conversations are critical, but we have to use our minds as educators <laughs> to really come up with ways around these things because we know that when we don't use diverse books in the classroom, we really are doing the students a disservice. That's all I have for now. And I'll quickly jump off what, what Dr. Flowers was just saying with the creative ways that teachers can kind of get around the limitations they might have in their district with book access or book challenges. I find I found for several elementary teachers that I work for, and when I was teaching elementary myself, that morning meeting was always a very flexible time where the district had not, or they haven't yet thought how to script it out. So that was always where I did my, my daily read aloud and would be able, able to have really great diverse literature and have those discussions and also build that community that sets the tone for the day. So that's how I would like to schedule it if you if you do have a really tight curricula for everything. I wanted to connect to something that Dr. Flowers said as well, um, because I typically work with pre-service teachers, and I do believe there are some on the webinar um, this evening. Um, I've had a recent very positive experience with, um, with a principal in our district. When I asked a bit about book challenges and how we were to handle that, and um, and she said, oh, we're not keeping good books out of the hands of kids. And so I know I always tell my pre-service teachers that when you go for an interview, um, you are also interviewing the school. And so talking to that principal about their stance on book challenges and their stance on children's literature in general, it might give you a feel for what kind of backing and support you would have to make um, informed critical decisions about the types of literature that you share with your students. So that may not help any in-service teachers who are on the call, but I do think that for our pre-service teachers, you know, we, we want you to step into a setting where you're going to be um, successful and feel fulfilled and feel supported. And so sometimes asking those questions can help you to gauge um, where that administrative team lands on things like book challenges. Thanks, everybody. Dr. Flowers, your point about connecting these books to student achievement, I think, is so um, important. It makes me think about when when I was a high school English teacher facing a book challenge around the color purple. Um, we tried to, we did that exact thing to keep the book in our curriculum. We used we connected that book to every other initiative the district had. We said it was about college readiness. We said it was about 21st century skills. We said it was about, you know, communicating with uh, multiple with multiple perspectives, like every single initiative that the school district 
claim to value, we said this book does all of that. And so I think that's a, a great point around saying these texts are the vehicle to what we care about most, which is student achievement. So I just wanted to underscore that. I think that's excellent. Um, we have a couple great questions in the chat. Um, I want to start with a question that Dr. Wiseman, you've, you've put a resource there, so I want to highlight that. Um, but there's a great question, I think, about parents um, and how we can support, encourage, empower parents to sort of pick up um, the, the flag and um, push back and, and support these books um, in, our, in our schools and, and speak up at school board meetings where they're being um, challenged and discussed. So anything that you have uh, related to supporting parents in the work of um, supporting the freedom to read? I dropped a um, resource in there. They they actually um, help you think about how parent. I mean, from a parent standpoint, um, going to school board meetings, ways that you you know scripts that you can use, how to organize and coordinate um, other people to go with you, and I think there's power in numbers. And you know, just like they shared at the beginning, there's like eleven people that are responsible for all of most of these book bans. And so what we need to do is also mobilize and take action. And so it's great to know that parents might have interests in doing that. Um, and many of us educators are also parents too. And so we have an interest from both sides to do that. Um, so other people are putting links here too. So, um, Florida Freedom to Read project. There's there's other stuff and maybe state by state. Um, so we can share more suggestions as time goes. Uh, so I was just going to say in terms of the parents, uh, you know, because the legislation, the way that it's written, it's laid out to empower parents. Parents can also introduce a measure at the local level, which states that nobody can put in a challenge to a book unless their child attends that specific school. And I'm not saying it's going to pass, <laughs> but you can introduce that measure because I think that people don't understand that the majority of the people who are putting these challenges up, they don't even have children enrolled in these schools. Some of them aren't even in the state. And so, you know, getting up at school boards and, and letting people know that is really important because I don't think people understand uh, the level of disruption to a child's educational experience that's happening right now. I, I don't think people understand uh, or grasp the gravity of what this is going to mean when children take those standardized tests in the spring without books in a library, without books in the classroom, without having access to books at a local library. You know, I don't, you know, it's gonna be interesting for sure. I mean, you're gonna see some very vocal parents at that point, even the ones that are really quiet now. Because when it starts affecting people's individual households, people look at those situations very differently. Along the lines of organizing or helping parents to identify where they may get involved, um, one thing that came to my mind is uh, even yourself connecting with some of your local civil rights organizations. Um, I, I'm involved in my local chapter of the NAACP, and I know that we are very vocal about, um, about these kinds of things. Uh, we meet regularly with the superintendent. And so just connecting with organizations like that in your own community, you can learn um, what is being done in an organized way to push back um, against these 11 people across the nation who are, are the, the source of most of these bans. Because I, I think that there, there is power in finding a different collective voice, one that says, um, no, we're not, we're not actually about this. You know, because I, I think often it is sold as though um, there's a majority of people who object to, to books, to many, many books, um, when it's just simply not true. And so I think if we help to shine a light on the rest of that story, then that can also be a really powerful way to push back. Thanks, everyone. Um, 
Dr. Flowers, there's a question in the chat that I know you've responded to there, but I, I think it might be good just for to for everyone to hear a little bit more about um, the literature circles that you are engaging in with students and how those um, were used to help students explore critical issues. Do you mind talking just a little bit more about that and how you responded in the face of some um, resistance there? So what she's referring to is the project that I did in the prison system where I had the, uh, I actually trained counselors to go in and do literature circles with the students. And so uh, what we did prior to initiating the project is we picked out all the books, but before we even did that, we met with the students. We did a genre interest inventory to figure out what type of books the children like to read. And so after we did that, then we selected the books and then we evaluated them to make sure that the kids would be able to actually read the books because uh, readability is an issue as well. In terms of um, dealing with any kind of controversy, we did have controversy because we were using the renegade books as the children called it, but they were actually banned books. Uh, so what we did, we actually did an activity with the students um, called Never Judge a Book by Its Cover. And so we covered the books and we wrote on, on the front of the books why the books had been banned. And so the students, we turned it into a class activity and the students could select a book based on why it had been banned. And so everybody um, ended up with a book that they really, really wanted to read. And so we went from there. I think the controversy kind of died down when they saw that it was more about student choice rather than us going in and saying, hey, this is a controversial book, we're going to read it. Um, and it's interesting how when you frame it around students, it's less resistance, you know, as opposed to it being a teacher choice, which, you know, we want students to have agency anyway. But that was how we kind of navigated a lot of the issues. Um, there were things that did come up. And I think that if you interact with children and read books, you know that that's never the end. Uh, I always urge people to be really honest about, you know, what's going on with children as they're reading the books. There were children who uh, we were reading um, Jacqueline Woodson's book about the little girls that, that ran away from home. I always forget the name of it. Um, Lena, we were reading Lena. And one of the little girls, uh, she, had, she had been uh, sexually abused as a child. And so when she read that portion of the book where they were describing how some adults are interested in children, um, it wasn't even graphic, but she ended up having an emotional breakdown. And so we did, um, because you know we knew we were reading controversial books, we knew something would come up and we knew the situation we were in. We actually had guidance counselors sit in on the sessions and they were able to discuss the books with the students. So I think we have to be, we know that we're reading books that are tough for children, but I also think there has to be some intellectual honesty with that when we know that certain children think of books as triggers or topics as triggers, we have to have those important conversations. I don't think we should be dancing around that at all. I think we, you know, if we're going to tell teachers, hey, use these books, we need to come up with different approaches for them to integrate these books within the classroom. And so uh, the counselor talked to the little girl about everything that was going on with her. You know, kind of, we kind of gave her a journal so that she could read and, and talk about it. And Within a, within a couple of weeks, she was fine, but you know it did bring up some issues for her and it unearthed some things that she really had to deal with. And I think if you're somebody who does um, social emotional learning, you're working with the non-traditional population as, as I'm describing it, you know that there are other issues that come up as well from bullying to um, all kinds of things. And so it is important to have those type of discussions with students because we have to educate students to live in the world. Um, we can't sit there and protect them from every single thing because that's just really not realistic. All right. Are there any other questions about that in the chat? I know there's some new questions popped up. Some comments. It's, it looks like the USF Library is doing a similar project by covering um, banned books with the reason that they're being banned. So that's a great connection. Um, 
as you were talking, Dr. Flowers, I was wondering um, if Dr. Wiseman wanted to add on to that with some of your trauma-informed approaches um, and framework with, with students and techs. I was trying to um, draw a thread there, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I was, I was thinking similarly. Um, one of the things that we have to do is prepare teachers to be able to handle difficult conversations. And um, a lot of times, you know, many teachers do not feel comfortable when um, difficult topics come up. And, and this, you know, and those can come up even if you're reading any book. But just thinking about that and thinking about what do we do when um, when people do feel uncomfortable. And again, a lot of this has to do with creating a, a community, but also um, there's the notion of um, witnessing other people's stories and um, and really providing um providing feedback that normalizes, that supports them, that accepts them as opposed to not. And so when somebody shared something difficult, that's their testimony. And as a you know witness, you want to just share that, that you are supportive of them and that you've accepted them. And so I think that goes back to one of my, again, going from a trauma-informed standpoint to actually ban topics like this um, further traumatizes people that are being represented by the topics that are being banned, which is, which is definitely a concern. Um, I also think there's a real important aspect of collaborating with social workers and mental health professionals. So I use children's literature in a family literacy program for um, families, particularly parents who are in residential treatment for substance use disorder, and they've also been incarcerated. So we use those books and we say, you know, let's let's talk about these books and also you can use these books to read with your kids. And a lot of times um, what comes out are very emotional feelings um, and experiences. And as an educator, I, I can facilitate those discussions, but I lean on collaboration with social workers and psychologists too. So I think it's important that we all work together um, in in dealing with these issues and really thinking about what's um, what's difficult um, and when difficult stories emerge. So um, yeah, so that's my connection. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I didn't mean to unmute um, preemptively Dr. Persan or Dr. Ola if you wanted to layer on there. Um, but I, I was thinking, and, and someone put it in the chat too, you know, there's interesting language in recent Florida legislation about um, preventing discomfort among students or, you know, any kind of emotional uh, response in students. And that's, I think, some really interesting thinking, right? Like that sometimes discomfort um, is a, an appropriate response to learning something about our history. You know, it's not always bad. And uh, the push to sort of protect students from any kind of emotional response is not really preparing them for um, the world. It's not really preparing them for appropriate emotional health um, or issues. So yeah, I, I appreciate the the meme there. Um, we're, we're coming down to the, the final few minutes here. So I think what I'll do is just sort of open it up to the panel for sort of a final word. Um, if there's anything that you didn't get to say that you really would like to, or sort of a, a closing thought that you want to leave um, our participants with, we have just like a minute or two for each person to share that. And then I know that um, Dr. Persan and Dr. Outlaw want to share information about additional resources and um, the master's program here at USF. But let's Let's just do sort of a final word or final thought. Um, Dr. Persan, can I start with you? And we'll go to Dr. Outlaw, Dr. Wiseman, Dr. Flowers, and then we'll go back to you, uh, Dr. Persan. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think the kind of the final word I'd like to leave folks with is to find your people, find your network, because I think that um, the work, this work feels overwhelming when you're doing it by yourself. But I think whenever you have a community, when you can bounce ideas off of folks, um, even if your community is is not local, if you find uh, you know a national a nationwide community, we've learned lots of ways to connect with folks over these last few years. So 
find your people so you have some space to talk and to think and and to continue doing the good work. My, I guess my final thought uh, would be inspired from Dr. Goldie Muhammad's research in culturally and historically responsive literacy instruction and really thinking about teaching through joy. And I think even with unstable context that we teach in and challenges with book access, I think find joy in working with your students and find the passions and joys that they have in their lives and select your books and your text discussions that kind of capitalize on those and then just connect it to the standard that way. So don't start standard first or with the challenge first, start with the joy first, student passion, student interests, then connect it to the text that you can use and the text that you share with students and then then connect it back to the standards because you can always address the standards through what you're reading and discussing with your students. And I just want to say that um, that books provide such opportunities for understanding, for developing empathy, for gaining perspective. And um, I believe that literature has the potential to create a more just world, that when we are showing diverse representation, we're allowing students and children to realize the potential of who they are and what they can be. And um, so I want to just leave people with that idea of telescoping in their future and um, providing an opening opportunities for letting them be who they are. So I just wanted to chime in as well as we close out. And I want you all to think about just kind of everything that we've talked about tonight from discussing the prevalence of these book bans to what's going on with children in the classroom. And I wanted to leave you with the advice of thinking about or jotting down for the next few months before these test scores come out uh, in the spring. What can you, we do collectively to restore the trust in education in Florida? because at the end of the day, it's going to come down to that. We're going to have to restore the public trust uh, after this controversy is over. And trust me, it will be over at some point. <laughs> you, know, nothing, you know, nothing lasts forever. What can we do? Because we have to think about how children will be impacted for years to come. We just came off of COVID where children were out of school for two years. And now we have all of this book banning. And so more and more children are not getting access to the books as well as the curricula and the experiences they need to prepare them as adults. And so as we think about how we will restore that trust in public education from parents and community members, uh, that will really give us a roadmap for what we need to do to carry us into the future. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you all. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Persan to talk about the resources, uh, master's degree opportunity, and then the certificate link. Sure. So um, you have a QR code here uh, that will take you to a web asset that includes um, a list of resources. And it looks like we may have a couple more to add to that because I see um, Susie Aryev has also added a link um, to some USF resources. So maybe we can put that there as well as a few of the other things that were mentioned this evening. So I just want to give everybody a chance to capture that. And Rachel, you're sending this out later. Okay, so everyone will have a chance to scan the code there. Um, but a, a list of resources, including some from some folks who were invited to be on the panel but weren't able to attend this evening. The other thing that we wanted to mention um, is that if if you like thinking about these things, if you want to, to come and have more conversations, and I say come in a very loose sense because we offer a master's of art in reading education that is fully online. If you are interested in a reading master's from USF, um, please do visit this bit.ly link. And we would love to connect with you to share more about um, what the program entails, um, and and all the details of the classes and uh, and the schedule and, and all of those good things. So we do hope that you will join us, or if you know anyone who is contemplating a master's degree, please do um, tell us about tell them about the the wonderful folks in literacy at USF. 
And one last slide, if you are um, in a position where it does you some good to receive PD hours for participating in things like that, um, please do scan this QR code or grab the tiny URL link in order to enter your information and um, receive uh, documentation of your time spent with us this evening. Rachel, do you wanna close us out? Yeah, I just wanna thank uh, our panelists, our moderators and all the participants for being here tonight. I know that everybody's plates are over full and everybody worked a long day um, and then spent an hour and a half with us tonight talking about this important topic. So um, thanks to all of you for, for being here. Um, I always say it's a hard time to be in education. So if nobody has yet today thanked you for all you do for students and families that you serve at all levels, um, thank you so much for for, for being an educator. We need you now more than ever. So we'll leave the QR code up for folks who need a, a certificate. Um, but thank you everybody for being here and for your time, especially our panelists. We can give them a virtual round of applause um, and thank yous in the chat. Thanks everybody.